I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Sonic Perspectives, we are speaking with Joey Tempest of Europe to talk about the release of the band's new single, Hold Your Head Up, an album that's in the works, and a new documentary that's coming out on the band in 2024. Joey, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time. Hey, thanks for having me on here. How are you doing? Good. I, I know you're in London getting ready for a show for the Time Capsule Tour, so uh, you must be very close to showtime. It is It's only an hour and a half, I believe, and... Uh um, it, it's getting very exciting. I mean, we're on this tour, 21, 21 shows, mm -hmm. and it's um, a 40th anniversary evening with Europe. So it's kind of a different show, and it's been going so well. So I'm really getting excited about playing London. I obviously, I, I live in London, so it's a home gig for me. And Stockholm is also a home gig, so I got two home gigs, you know, on the, on the tour. I was in London a few years ago. Uh, tremendous city. It's, it's such a beautiful city, so... Exactly. You know, it's a, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. We spoke in 2017 for Walk the Earth, and uh, this song is so exciting. It's, it's so long overdue for the fans. It's a great song, and uh, we're excited to see you back. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, luckily we made it into the studio this summer before the tour kicked off, and, and we managed to... I had an idea during uh, the, the pandemic years. It was Nothing was happening. I was collecting ideas, and this one was the one I felt really strong I think it's great, yeah. You know, I read that you're going to put, be putting out a documentary in 2024, and I was wondering, is this new song, Hold Your Head Up, a retrospective tribute for the film, as part of the film? And Because it pays really nice tribute to the band, it talks about your father, so I thought it was a really great song. It just came together that way, which is a good observation, and I think it was only luck, really, that everything tied together so nicely. Um, and the, the, we are in the documentary that's coming out uh, featuring this recording uh, session as well, of course. And, and it's, I, I believe the, early in the documentary, you see us in the studio and it starts with us today. But then you get transported back to uh, the suburbs of, of Las Vegas when we were teenagers, you know, coming up with a name and, and discussing, you know, everything and dreaming about becoming a touring band. And then all the way through, we found footage on VHS from hotel rooms, from <laughs> recording studios. It, it's, we had more material than we thought, and, and it became a really good story in the end. And we're in the final stages. We're not really there. We're almost there. So I believe early next year, it's, uh, it's probably like, likely. Will it be like a Netflix streaming release, or will it be a theatrical release? You know, how does it, how, what's, what's the thought process right now? Yeah, we're involving some people to get us to get us the most interesting scenario. It could be that. It could be that. It could be on any platform. But it will be a serious thing. We want people to see it. We want all the fans to see it. But also, it seems like a great story about the era and everything. So I think we can broaden this a bit. I think it could be very exciting. Oh yeah, I'm excited about it. Just right now, thinking about it. You know, and I. <laughs> I also read um, you have a new album in the works, um, potentially late 2024, early 2025. How deep are you in the recording process? Because if you just did the single in the summer and you're on tour, when are you guys going to have time to put this all together? Yeah, we, we talked about that the other week, and we have ideas already. There's yeah. some great ideas, and uh, Hold Your Head Up was one of them. Um, so we're not completely starting from scratch. We have some great song ideas, and we're thinking this winter will be a great time to just get together and also send ideas to each other. We will record next year, and like you said, if we're lucky, we get it out in 2024, otherwise only 2025, but we will get to, into recording, and we're looking forward to that, actually. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked the earth with, uh, you know, in Abbey Road Studios in, what, 2017 or something, yeah. Yep. You know, um, I have to wonder too, um, when you guys go into the studio, do you have the songs fleshed out in advance or are you writing in the studio or just ideas? What, what do you guys like to do as a band? Usually we are very well prepared because okay. we don't like to leave much to chance. But we do tend to leave a few things in the air 
Uh, there could be bridges here, there may be an intro, maybe a song is not really 100%. But I have to say, we usually want to be rehearsed between 10 to 15 songs before we enter the studio. So that's the kind of band we are. Sometimes we get a little bit lazy and, and maybe write a little bit in the studio. It depends on the producer. When we work with Dave Cobb, he's actually a good writer himself. So he can he can just join in on, on a bridge, on an intro or, or something, you know, like that. And, and that works really well because we know him. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, yeah, we can write maybe one song in the studio, but usually we're, 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 we're ready. You know, um, I know you're still working on the songs itself, but are there any unexpected moments that fans could uh, look forward to from Europe on this album? Something maybe a little different song-wise? A little left turn? Well, maybe. I, well, usually, as you know, if you listen to it, you seem like you're familiar. Yes. We do tend to take a new adventure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. On every album, and I'm sure, I'm sure there's time. I mean, I think Hold, hold Your Head Up's got some great punch to it, and it's got... It's got some Europe older elements, but it also feels a bit kind of modern. And, and so uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I think I have a few ideas that are a little bit different, and I haven't, you know, we haven't rehearsed them yet. So yeah, th there'll be some exciting stuff that's going to be different from, from the last good, one. That's good, for sure. Yeah, I think we, we we love that about the band. That you know, a little expected, unexpected left turn on a song here or there or a part. So it's it's always exciting to hear that from you yeah. guys. Um, and I gotta ask, living in the United States, can we see you guys back in uh, the United States, maybe to promote the album when it does come out in 2024, 2025? Yeah, I hope so. I really, really hope so. I mean, our management is based in, in, in California, so we have we have an agent. We are looking all the time, and as you may know, we were supposed to go there 2020 yeah. on a major two and a half month tour. And it didn't happen because of everything yeah. that went on, and, and that was a pity. But but and we've been looking ever since, and it's it's about finding the right scenario, and the right package, right band to go with, or if we go into the House of Blues style style again, we we're looking at all the scenarios. But that's really important on our list to get back to America. So I really hope we do that soon. Me too. Me too. I I, I think the last time I saw you was. Uh, geez, maybe 2015. You were up in California during Nam, and I think we saw you then. I was at the I was yeah. at Nam, yeah. So that was kind of exciting to see that. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're such an expressive lyricist who can really paint pictures in people's minds, and a terrific storyteller when about writing posit positivity and hope. Um, what do you think is your biggest strength as a songwriter? I don't know where it comes from, but I know my mom has always been a very positive soul. Mm -hmm. And I think I got some of her her thinking when it comes to all that thinking there's always hope, there's always light, you know. So there's, that always sort of creeps in. Even if we, we, we actually write about a tragic event in the world or anything like that. But yeah, I don't know. It's just the way I am, I suppose. And, and uh, But that doesn't stop us from maybe sometimes just finding issues that, that are more serious, but try to present it in an entertaining and more, you know, maybe get people to think a bit, but also what we deal with here is music and entertainment and rock and roll. So I've never gone down the road of trying to do a, a, a serious album about a theme or, we, we started a little bit with that, with um, Walk the Earth, we wanted to make sort of a album about where democracy went and stuff. Yeah. Halfway through, we sort of, uh, hang on a second, we're a rock band. That's, but there's a few things in there, I think, that are that, a bit more when you think a little bit, you know. But anyway, so we're ma mainly an entertainment band, I suppose. No, that's true. Um, what inspires you lyrically now um, compared to when you first started in Europe? Well, you, you evolve, don't you? You get older and you start thinking yeah. about things a different way. You have experience. You, you can compare things. You have a, a later career, you have an early career, you can look at things in relation to each other and a bit more depth, I suppose. And, and you've read more and you have this new more music, read books. And I suppose you evolve. <laughs> but I do like to anchor lyrics in in uh, reality a bit more now than maybe the first album okay. when we were like 18. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes in those days, it was cool when it sounded cool. I mean, that's it. You know, that's enough sometimes. 
right, right. But right. Um, yeah, so uh, like uh, hold your head up. Obviously, my my dad passed away with the pandemic, and, and it just it wrote itself the lyric. And, and I remember him telling me, you know, come on, get up, you can do it. You know, just yeah. be proud. You can do it. Come on, I know you can do it. So that was kind of the idea behind that. But I'm sure that the, the rest of the album will have things anchored around the band or anchored around the, what's happening in the world or anchored around my, my life and yeah I think you evolve that way you don't you don't just write about nothing important to yourself anymore right. so that, that's probably the difference I get it and I'm, I'm sorry about your dad's passing I'm sorry to hear that oh no no it's fine it's a few years ago now and he, he, had, a, he had a good life and, and uh, he was a great guy yeah very cool. Um, are you always inspired to create music? You wake up every morning going, I got an idea, or I'm going to sit down to write today, or, you know, are you always focused on that? Yeah, I, I think about music every day, and I listen to music every day. I play uh, guitar or keyboard almost every day. I, I, would, I, would, I would think every day. It depends on if I'm traveling or what I'm doing. But yeah, it's part of my life since I was six or seven years old as far as I can remember because yeah. it was all me there was instruments at home my sister had a guitar and a, and, and a, a piano and she didn't continue but I took over and since <laughs> then I've always I like to express myself I, it makes me feel good to play and to write and work on ideas so yeah I, I do it all the time I collect lyrics and melody lines all the time on my mobile etc you know all that stuff and yeah. oh, that's awesome yeah um what are one or two, you know, talking, going back to the whole idea of the documentary now, what are one or two of the key attributes that you feel have carried Europe through all the ups and the downs of the music businesses and the challenges that the band faces on a daily basis? I think one of the things is that we're from the same place, all of us. Mm -hmm. And we used to go and watch concerts together, whether it was Stinglisi or, you know, Rainbow, White Snake or Deep Purple or anything. We went together and we started rehearsing together and we partied together in those days. We, we were in sort of different schools, a few of us, but we were still connected with friends or after school or weekends or, or in bands and watching each other play. I think that's one of the things that now we really appreciate after, after all these years, that we have these memories and this connection. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like it's one soul with five different elements in it. And uh, I think it carries us now because the egos have calmed down a little bit so there's no major fights and it seems like we, we feel lucky that we have each other and have this job um that's and so the, and, and the musical the music uh we are all in agreement of certain artists and music styles so that means it's never going to be any major issue with choosing songs or writing songs we are in the same realm same world so there's not going to be a dispute uh going down different musical routes you know some some people some bands they leave each other fighting you know musical differences so i'm like yeah well, how is that possible it, I, mean, I mean of course it can be possible but in a in a in a band that's been together a long time it's it's kind of difficult to cite that as a reason because we have so much in common when it comes to music Right, it's it's like a five way marriage and it's a history. So yeah, it's it would make only sense that yeah. you guys would be all on the same page. Yeah, mostly on the same page when it comes to those important bits as a band need to be music and direction and playing live and, and, and stuff like that. Maybe even merchandise, maybe even fonts and posters and stuff like that. If you're in the same world, then you're not going to have any big, you know, uh, disputes. You know what I'm excited about the documentary too is that, you know, reliving, I love the 80s, that's where I grew up in the 80s, I was in a band in the 80s, played guitar, it was such a great time, um, and I'm excited to see some footage from the 80s in your film. Um, is there anything worth reliving from the 80s that you would do all over again in a heartbeat if you could? Well, I, it was, there are some fun moments, I mean, there's some good stuff, All everything is in the documentary, you know, there's the, 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 the stuff we didn't like so much, all the TV shows with the playback shows and stuff, um, and the, especially the, music, the, the real musicians like it, in us, we're like, what, what's this about? You know, we don't want to keep doing this, and uh, especially some of us hated it more. Um, there are elements, however, when we start to become one of the biggest bands in the world, going through cities like Rome, Paris, New York, LA, um, Madrid, uh, uh, Tokyo. 
we are experiencing this together, going out to clubs after the shows and and just feeling on top of the world. I mean, that feeling is still there. You know, we yeah. still we we were there. We have it. We still have that. You can tap into all that stuff because we've been through it. And there, there was great moments and uh, tough moments too. There's a lot of traveling, a lot of playback shows, a lot of photo sessions, and. Uh, when we wanted to be on the road instead. <laughs> that was one of the things. But all that's in the documentary. And then we had the down period when the grunge came and right. the band went home to Stockholm and, and some of the guys had some, you know, uh, they ended up having less money and it was, uh, it was, it was tough for some of the guys for a while and for some, uh, and, and we, we met each other again and, and we wanted to help, help each other, carry each other. And, and then now we've been together longer than the first run. Yeah. It's just about, it's just about communicating and having the same goal and, and work together. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very cool story. That's a, that's a testament to your friendship more than anything else. Music aside, yeah, exactly. it's just friends, you know, five friends. Yeah, yeah, you, that's it. When you were touring in the 80s, was it like Beatlemania? You know, like with the people just filling up the streets and chasing you guys? Yeah, it was. <laughs> we discussed it in documentary. We discussed it in documentary. We, we, we fled out of big churches when people started in Rome. People started recognizing us. We, we couldn't actually go walk the streets in major cities of Europe for a while. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, in, in sitting in cars, go into shows and going from shows. It was almost impossible. Wow. And some of those stories are in the documentary. It's kind of, yeah, it, it, it got a bit it, out of control for a while. But, you know, it, it's also kind of cool to get through it. And it was all, it was all a good thing. I mean, people, people were, were wanting a piece of us, you know, <laughs> but it was kind of crazy. Great. I, I, I want to be respectful to your time. I have one last question for you. You know, on the first two albums, um, you were playing keyboards. And then, I guess, on the third album, you brought in Mick. Uh, tell me about the decision and the transition to have him as a fifth member. Uh, maybe you didn't want to do keys anymore in the band? or What, what was the rationale? Yeah. Well, there was an early moment in Europe's career where I played a bit of keyboard on stage. And this was, <coughs> this was very early on. And... I had a bad experience on stage. This is also in the documentary. The keyboard broke down, and I'm standing there, and I'm trying to end the day, and I have a keyboard just misfiring, sounding weird. And, and, and it was one of those decisions that night, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna go down this route. And even though if I played a bit on the albums, the first two albums, I, in the back of my mind, and in the back of our minds, we, we were, we wanted to be, have that extra dimension of a keyboard player. And, when we saw Mick McAley in, in his band Avalon, and he was a friend in school, he was actually the guy that lent me a keyboard <laughs> early on in, in college where I wrote the final countdown on. Wow. And um, he's, he were connected, Mick and I, in that sense. He was the only guy in school I knew who had a keyboard. So I walked up to him and was like, hey man, you got a keyboard. So it was kind of uh, weird. That's all in the documentary, but it was, uh, so that's the first time I met him in, in his school, saw him play. But then later on, we remembered him, and he was part of the scene in Atlas Fest. He was part of, he played in different bands, and we all saw him play. And they opened up for us at one show as well. It was kind of cool. And so we, we, we went to ask him, <laughs> and he, he pretended to be like cool about it, you know, but inside, he, he says in the documentary, I was like, yes, 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 I want to be in this band, I want to tour, I want to tour. I only tour once a year with my band. Yeah, I want to be in this. So yeah, that was uh, it was kind of nice to get him in. And at the same time, Ian came in around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so 1985, 1984, 85, everything kicked off with this lineup, the five, the five guys that we're with today. Sure, sure. Well, listen, Joey, I want to thank you so much for your time. It was an insightful and really entertaining interview. Thank you so much. And I, I wish you uh, a great show tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Good thank questions. you. See you later, man. Bye-bye.